Thank you. So my name is Sarah Kay. I'm 21 years old. I was born and raised here in New York City. Um, as Jennifer said, my mother is Japanese American. My father is Brooklynese American. And I attended the United Nations International School here in Manhattan from kindergarten through 12th grade when I graduated and then moved to Providence, Rhode Island to attend Brown University, where I will graduate from in 27 days if everything goes as planned. Um, and it's, it's an incredible honor to be here today because I am a huge fan of the Acumen Fund and the work that Jacqueline Novogratz has done, and I consider her a, a personal hero. So it's really wonderful to be able to be here to speak with you today. Given that I grew up in a biracial household in the diverse city of New York, in the international atmosphere of my school, Starting from a very young age, I was taught to always have a global perspective, which sounds funny, but the truth of the matter is I learned Native American folk songs before I ever learned the words to the U.S. national anthem. I learned West African folklore and fables before I ever heard about Tom Sawyer and Huck Finn. That's just how I grew up. And growing up, that way in that environment, I was taught that no matter who you are, you are always the blind man with the elephant, which is to say that no matter what you think you have your hand on, it is so much bigger than you know. And I've kept that thought with me as I've grown older, and it was very important to me because I liked knowing that I was just a very small piece of a much bigger puzzle, and that what I was living was only one experience, and there were so many other different versions of that experience all over the world, ones that I could never even conceive of. And storytelling had a big part of my upbringing and was a big part of my education because it was through these stories from other countries and other cultures that I learned about the world. And that I learned that telling stories is a human instinct. That No matter where you're from, no matter where you are in the world, people love telling stories to their friends, to their families, to strangers on the street. It's just something that we as people love to do. And as I traveled, through the world and, and I got to go to all these different places, I learned that we tell the same stories all over the place. Now the details may change and the names may change, but we're always telling stories of strength and stories of sorrow and stories of love and pain and joy because I think there is such a thing as the human story. And that has been very important for me as I've grown up and as I've been a storyteller and collected stories and learned about stories. And my love of storytelling is what brought me to spoken word poetry, which is the art form of performing poetry in the oral tradition instead of just writing it down on paper. And I discovered spoken word poetry when I was 14 years old. I was a freshman in high school. And I fell madly in love with it, and I couldn't stop doing it. And I was fortunate enough to find a place in Manhattan called the Bowery Poetry Club where they were very kind and tolerant of a 14-year-old girl who would come in and be really excited, even though I was probably a decade younger than everybody there. And by the time I was 16, I made this shocking realization, which was that I was significantly happier than all the other teenagers that I knew. And I couldn't figure out why. And then I decided that it was because of spoken word poetry. And there is something very powerful about teaching a 14-year-old whose instinct is, nobody understands me, I'm totally alone in the world, nobody knows what I'm going through, this is all about me. To teach that 14-year-old, if you can figure out a way to articulate your feelings and your opinions and your thoughts on the world, and then find a way to be brave enough to get on a stage and present those opinions to a room full of people, that room full of people is going to listen to you. And not only are they going to listen to you, they're going to applaud when you're done. And not only are they going to applaud, but someone in the audience is going to come find you afterwards and say, hey, I really felt what you were saying up there. 
And that might not sound like a big deal to us in this room because we're doing it right now. But when you're 14 years old, that is huge. That is mind-boggling and life-changing, and it really was for me. And I decided that if I could teach all of my friends this and give them that gift, that they would all be happier too. And so I started this thing called Project Voice. And the entire focus of Project Voice was being able to use spoken word poetry as a way to entertain, inspire, educate, and empower teenagers. And I thought I would give it up when I got to Brown. I thought it was a high school hobby and I would get to Brown and have so many more exciting things to do. And when I got there, I was asked to perform at a high school up the street from the campus called Hope High School. And out of the 52 high schools in Rhode Island, Hope High School usually ranks about 48th or 49th. It's a pretty rough place to go to school. And I got there, I was a freshman in high school. I was doing this performance, a pr freshman in college, doing this performance for high school students. And I had a poem about what it meant to grow up as a teenager in America. And I was performing this poem, and there's a line in the poem that says, pregnant teenage girls. And as I said the line, I looked up and realized that in the front row, there were three different girls all holding newborn babies on their laps. And I was only a freshman in college, which meant that they couldn't have been any more than, at the most, four years younger than me. Most of them probably were less. And this was an incredibly important moment for me because I realized, you know what, what I thought was important to learn from spoken word poetry for me is so important for so many teenagers to be able to tell their own story. And the most important thing I think I've learned from Jacqueline Novogratz, and this is something that I've kept with me in all my work now, is the idea that dignity is more important to the human spirit than financial wealth. And she talks about imagining a world beyond poverty. And to me, it's not just poverty in terms of finance and shelter and, and money and jobs. There's also such a thing as poverty of spirit and how important it is for people to know that they have the ability to tell their own story. And so what I do is I try to teach teenagers in America and elsewhere, if I can get there, that not only is their voice and their opinion valid, but it's necessary. And the students that I teach, for the most part, most of their families are coming in under the poverty line. A lot of them have been involved in either gang or drug-related violence. And they are the same kids who, of their own, own choice, show up Friday afternoons, stay two hours late after school just to write and perform spoken word poetry. And it's because they're getting something out of that that they're not learning anywhere else. So I was lucky enough to, to experience how important that message is of dignity when I was in India two years ago working with an organization called Lighting a Billion Lives, which works to bring solar-powered lanterns to rural India, and it's based on the same concept that Acumen works on, which is microfinance, which is not just parachuting in and dropping off lanterns and running. It's about building infrastructure and entrepreneurship in those specific villages. And I am not an engineer, I am not a mechanic, and I was so inspired by the work that these people were doing to make a big difference. Thank you. <laughs>